And Suzanne, I don't know if you're there, but I'm back. I'm here, thanks. <laughs> so do you see at the very bottom of your screen? Yeah, I think I did it. I think. Okay. Oh, yep. It looks like you are live streaming. Perfect. Okay. But, okay. Juan told me. Uh oh. Oh, you can turn that off. I did. I've done that before. How do I do that? I think, is it in another screen? There we go. Okay. And I just mute it. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. I think I got it. Oh, it should be good to go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So how are you this morning? I'm kind of frazzled. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Today is going to be crazy. I um, I uh, went and got a tetanus shot on Monday. Actually, I didn't want the tetanus shot. That wasn't my plan. They, I was just going to get a refill on my prescription, but they were like, you're due for one. And I'm like, do I have to get it? And they're like, you probably should. And I'm like, okay, I was out yesterday. I went home. Um, I, I like, I told Robin, I'm like, I can't, everything hurts. I can't oh, no. do anything. And so I went, um, passed out from, let's see, I was, I think it was like 9 45 to 2 15. And then like all through the NLA meeting last night, I was just miserable. And I'm like, I don't know. I've never reacted that bad to a, to a vaccine, not even. Oh, no. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's terrible. So, but it's okay. I'm my <clears> arm. <throat> I still feel like somebody stabbed me in the arm, but you know, <laughs> at least I won't get tetanus. Right. <laughs> yeah. Apparently that means if it really knocked you out, I guess that means it oh. working. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see, I'm promoting people as they come in. Hi, Eric. Hi, Elizabeth and Elizabeth Johnson. Good morning, Susanna. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Johnson, um, you're from the HREC, so I'm gonna uh, go ahead and have you as a panelist so you can unmute and stuff and, um, yeah, I know you're just listening, but um, I thought I'd go ahead and let you into the meeting as a panelist. <clears throat> Great, good morning, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dana. Good morning. Morning, how are you? I'm good, thanks, how are you? Good. Pretty good. A little crazy this morning, I couldn't, um, Usually I can invite you all as panelists, but for some reason I couldn't do that this time. Oh, the mysteries of Zoom. So I'm, I'm uh, letting people in as they come. And we'll wait till Megan is here before we start. Hi, Scott. Okay. Hi, Hans. Good morning. I've been out there waiting, and it's been telling me the meeting will start anytime soon. So I, I checked out and checked back in, and. I'm late to the party. Oh, weird, huh? Um, I'm admitting people right now. Oh, it looks like Scott got bounced out. Let's see. Uh, Hi, Kathy. Hi. Let's see, I'm trying to get everyone in. Just take me a second. It looks like Scott Winters keeps getting bounced out. 
Let's see. Probably because his background is from off this earth. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Let me go ahead and hit record before I forget. All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Looks like Megan's here. Hi, Scott. You got in. That's good. <laughs> So let me just, as, oh, Brianna's having trouble. She keeps getting in and out. Okay. okay. Hi, Brianna. Are you Hello. in? Oh, I yay. am. Okay. Thank you. It's weird this morning. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So I don't know the mysteries of these <laughs> meetings. Um, anyhow, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, why don't we go ahead did I re uh, record to the cloud? Okay. Uh, okay. I think we're, we're ready, almost ready to go now. We might be missing a few. Oh, Stacey Whitty isn't here yet. Um, and Barb Campbell's out, out for a bit. So she'll, she won't be here today, but um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, it was kind of weird. We were meeting every two weeks and then there was this month. I feel really out of it because we had a month in between <laughs> meetings. So um, but we've got a lot to cover today, and as people are joining, I'm going to um, let them in. I was unable to invite folks as panelists this time. I'm not quite sure why. So uh, I'm doing it as we're, I'm trying to multitask. So maybe I'll hand it over to um, Megan uh, just to kind of start off, and we'll get going. Sure. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it, is, it does feel weird. I feel like we, we got off <laughs> of our schedule. Um, good morning, and um, hope you're all um, having a non-smoky day today. Um, I guess I wanted to start by um, introducing Elizabeth Johnson. Um, Elizabeth Johnson's new to uh, the sounding board and is a member of our newly formed Human Rights and Equity Commission. Um, so Elizabeth, thank you for being here. I don't know if you want to say hi or tell us a little bit about yourself. Totally up to you. Yeah, great. Thanks a bunch. Um, and thanks for, you know, having me uh, the opportunity to join you all. So uh, part of our work with the Human Rights and Equity Commission is really kind of being able to understand some of the processes that are happening around the city in all different types of arenas. Um, and so, uh, you know, assisting with things like housing and dealing with the um, helping with the houseless situations that's happening and, you know, all other aspects of life here in the city of Bend is, is stuff that we're interested in, you know, helping guide and support you all um, in making sure that equity is really um, being addressed in all aspects of what's happening within the city. So um, I am just observing today, kind of sitting in the background so I can see what's going on. Um, if you have questions about what we're doing, um, and then I hope to report back to them. We're having our meeting again this afternoon. So um, just reporting back to the HREC later on about what's happening with your, uh, your group. So thanks again. Thank you. Um, now that Stacy is here, I just wanted to also um, thank our, all of our incredible service providers who have done such hard work over the last couple of weeks of this extreme heat that we've had as well. Um, thank you for coming up with solutions and, and being there um, to help our, our houseless neighbors, um, you know, during a, a really, really scary time um, for our community. So. Thank you, Stacy, and and all of all of the rest of you who have, have helped um, in our sort of state of emergency that we've been having. Um, and I know that you know today. I think that we're really looking to um, to start taking some real action um, on these recommendations, so um, that we can continue sort of to move on to the community um, aspect of the community engagement aspect of this work. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to that today as well. So thank you, and um, it's good to see your faces again. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, thanks, Megan, and hi, Stacy. Hi, Scott. You keep getting bounced off, so I'm gonna try. Yeah, and... yeah. I had to switch computers. So. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if people get bounced off, I'll try my best to get you in right away again. So um, thanks for your patience. So. Um, yeah, it was a, it was weird to have a whole four weeks to, 
to kind of, I don't know, think about um, what we're doing and where we need to go. And um, I keep thinking it's August already, but it's only July. I don't know what my deal is, but um, I feel like we're making some really good progress. Um, let me go ahead and share um, the presentation and get us going. Um, I hope you all had time to read uh, the memos that were sent. So we can, we'll be going over those. Let's see. Um, where is my PowerPoint? <laughs> uh, sorry, folks, one sec here. Um, sorry, one sec here. No, no, I'm sharing. Uh, oh, here we go. There we go. <laughs> okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> One of those mornings I can tell. Okay, so uh, here's our agenda. Um, we're gonna go through um, the approval of the minutes and share any news folks have on the um, house listeners front and there's been a lot happening. So um, I thought it'd be good just to check in with everybody. Um, and then we're gonna review the last meeting progress and actions. Um, and then we'll keep going on our discussion of the zoning districts, the sizing requirements and parking and paving standards. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll touch on the public review, um, public or community engagement overview. It probably won't take 10 minutes because we're still in, in formation, but I'll show you what we're, we've been working on. Um, and then we'll have public comment. I didn't see anybody in the lobby but uh, we'll check in later on that um, and then wrap up and set the next meeting date. Um, so moving ahead, um, could we possibly get a motion to approve the June 9th minutes? I know Hans had a addition um, and I see your hand raised. So go ahead, Hans. I just wanted to mention, I, I think it's appropriate that we agreed as a group to present to the community building subcommittee, the issue of type one versus type two. I know we came away with some direction there. I, I think that's uh, something that was appropriate to mention in the minutes. I didn't see it there. Yeah, so, uh, so noted. Does anyone else have anything to add to the minutes? No, I'd be happy to move their approval. Second by Hans. Okay. Everyone in favor? Well, just a moment. Sorry, Suzanne. I just want to clarify. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Kathy, is your motion including via a uh, change made by Hans? Yes, because actually I'm the one that talked about it. So oh. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate Hans bringing that up. Yeah. Okay. Just want to be clear on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, that I include that. Okay. Great. Um, so all in favor with that amendment or Eric, you've raised your hand. Okay, aye. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think they're approved with that amendment. Okay. Um, and does anyone have news to share here? I'm gonna stop sharing um, so we can see each other. Do folks have news to share on the houselessness front? Um, this is Stacy. I can just share a few quick things. Um, Nativity Lutheran Church um, applied and was approved for a continuation of safe car parking. So we will continue being out there. Um, it's a it's a small it's a small group, but at least it's a few folks that are having a safe place to sleep and rest. The isolation motel. The end date for that is September thirtieth. Um, so we are working very hard to meet weekly with each of the guests to work on a plan for exit, um, housing, and just kind of unique options as to where they will go once uh, folks leave the isolation motel. Um, 
And I guess the only thing that could maybe change that is if there was some type of spike in the future. But as of now, September 30th is that end date. And then we just continue to see folks um, trying to find new areas to camp. So we're, we're working with that. So people are kind of spreading out. And then of course the ongoing Hunnell Road. Um, we're out at China Hat and Juniper Ridge and on the street. So we are continuing to partner and bring services to folks out there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I had a question on the isolation motel. Um, so it, it, I guess once maybe the, there's an end date and, and cases um, taper off, what will happen with the, are those just vouchers that you use? that the folks use for those or how does that work? No, so the isolation motel was a partnership between the county and neighbor impact, which took over the entire motel for our either COVID positive, presumptive um, test or high risk. And when I mean high risk, it was specifically pertaining to high risk for contracting COVID among our houseless community members. And now that things are coming down, the contract will come to an end. Um, and then we will look at, we're, we're attempting to VI spadat everybody to get them into the coordinated entry system when appropriate and work on other options in housing. So a um, lot of engagement out there. I don't yeah, know if that great. answered your question. Yeah, um, no, that's great. Does anyone have any questions on that? I think the other news to share is that the city closed on um, the motel for uh, Project Turnkey, 28 rooms. Uh, Councillor Perkins or Elizabeth, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, it's just a, it's a, a really exciting um, time for the city. You know, this the idea behind uh, this is that it's. Uh, you know, sort of a middle middle of the road in terms of transitional housing. Um, it's for people, you know, maybe they need to stay there a month, maybe six months, maybe even a year. Um, and there will be, Neighbor Impact will be providing um, management um, and they will be making the decisions in terms of um, who will be staying there. Um, and there will be supportive services on site um, for all the guests that, are, that will be there. Um, so we are you know, really excited about this huge new step and are really grateful to Project Turnkey. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone have anything else, Kathy? Yeah, thank you. I actually, it's more of a request um, from staff. Um, the uh, legislature passed a tremendous number of bills that impact housing and affordability. And also uh, there are funds coming from the state to our Central Oregon area. And I was wondering if it was possible perhaps in our next meeting to have a brief overview of how we see that impacting what we're doing here for the houseless, uh, you know, which, which bills um, specifically target that need and what that impact might be and then what funds might be coming from this, the legislature and the governor to help us with that. So um, just wanna put that out there because they actually had a very productive session given all things considered and there were so many things about housing. So that's it, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Lynn. But sorry, in. <laughs> I was going to say one of those bills was Senate Bill 8, which is a super exciting bill for publicly supported affordable housing. And um, AHAC is meeting today from three to five, and we'll have a very brief discussion of Senate Bill 8. If folks want to jump on that call later today, it's on the city calendar. Um, it, it's going to be a pretty quick presentation, but just to give a sense of sort of how anyone interested in developing affordable housing, and I'm mean saying affordable housing somewhat broadly, <laughs> um, uh, to, to utilize that bill. So that's the first step in that perhaps. We can definitely repeat it at future meetings and I'll, I'll touch base with Susanna on some other potentials, but that's your first teaser, I guess, of what's to come. So join us at AHAC at three if you're interested. Yeah, and at the next meeting, we can definitely have an overview. Um, we have a lot of funding coming um, to the city. Hans, it looks like you raised your hand. Um, and uh, we can definitely provide kind of a summary of all that we're doing uh, with the 
ARPA funds um, that we received uh, because of COVID relief and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that would be a good update. Um, Hans, go ahead. Just a thought when we're talking about legislation, uh, although it's a couple of years off, I think already some folks are un perhaps unduly alarmed about HB 3115. Uh, I had a nice conversation with Ian about that. And I think maybe if we just have some plans to at least be able to speak to 3115 when we do outreach, uh, again, it's perhaps not anything to be alarmed about. It has a lot more to do with the number of beds we're able to create and the number of managed camps or whatever we do as a group. But down the road a piece, um, I think there's there's some some bullet points we can speak to to get folks not to worry too much about you know the idea of people you know houseless camping anywhere they they choose. It's it's just something I think we should be prepared to speak to. Okay. Elizabeth Oshall, do you have any insight on, on that bill? Yeah, so thanks, Hans. The 3115 is a bill um, intended to, I guess, codify the case law. And I think we talked about this at one of our earlier meetings, um, a case out of Boise and a case out of Grants Pass, talking about when can a city um, prohibit and criminalize or uh, issue citations simply for the act of lying or sitting or sleeping on a public property. Um, and so 3115 um, puts some sidebars in place as to when a city and how a city can regulate the acts of sitting, sleeping, or lying on public property. Um, and so the reason this doesn't impact the city of Bend right now is it doesn't go into effect for um, a couple of years. And it only uh, applies to codes that um, restrict the acts of sleeping, sitting, or lying. And it does not apply to um, policies developed under a different section of the statute, um, talking about how the city engages in um, camp removal. So we don't currently prohibit um, or have any regulations that would be affected by this statute. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so any more news to share before we move? Oh, Eric, Eric Tobiasen, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to share a quick update on Veterans Village. I Great. think you can see my background is basically our site status right now. We've got four uh, what we call cabins. These are the shelters, the 12 by 12 shelters. We've got four of them vertical, about to put on some roofs, hopefully four or five of these um, in the next couple of weeks. And our community building is due to arrive on August 5th. Um, it's the fifth delay we've received, so I hope we receive it on time. But um, that so far they've been pushed out by COVID. Um, anyway, uh, our go live date is uh, probably on September 1st now. Thank you. Okay, great. May I interrupt and just do one more update? Um, I don't know if this is really the appropriate place, but I feel like I, I do want to mention something. Um, I just want to mention that during the exit um, and moving of our folks on Emerson, that Ben PD and other groups got a lot of negative press. I guess I just wanna make one mention here that I was down there consistently. And I have to tell you that our Ben PD treated those that were down there with the utmost respect and dignity. And um, I, I think it's important that we note that, especially in light of the, some of the press that they got. Um, I, it was very difficult for them to stand and not react when they were being screamed at for probably three or four hours um, and sworn at. I have seen our, our agencies and our police department step up. We know as a region, we don't have all of the services that we need and that there are many gaps in services, but at the same time, um, our houseless community is definitely respected and treated um, with dignity. And in light of the two men that passed away on Hunnell Road, I do wanna make mention that those two men, terrible, terrible travesty, but at the same time, it was devastating. Those two men I've known for five years and were very well connected to services. And I think it's really 
important for us as social service providers in the city to remember that we can bring services to people and make things available, but we also can't force people to always take advantage. And one of the challenges is when you are a voice for the houseless, you, I think it's important to also be a voice for our city, our county, and um, all of our vulnerable communities. So I just wanted to make note of that, um, just, just for the record. I, I just want to say thank you for saying that because just being on the outside, listening to all of the different, I don't think I've ever heard that point of view um, in in the general community. So I really appreciate you sharing that and I will continue to share that message as well because I think it's important that you can only do so much and be involved at a, to a certain extent and you're doing everything that you can and I think that's important. Thanks, Stacy, for um, for saying that, and I'll pass that along um, to PD and Fire. Yeah, and everyone involved. It was a it was a big effort. I was not uh, directly involved, but there was a lot a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen <laughs> for it, working really hard. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, let me go ahead and resume sharing, and uh, we'll move on. Um, Let's see. Susanna, I see Eric has his hand up. Is that oh, thanks. Um, Go ahead. another comment or is that left over? Eric? Yeah, it was stuck up. Is it still showing up? I don't think so. I think it's down. Thanks for that. helping me with the, that. It's so hard to see everything. Um, so, okay. Our timeline that we've looked at a lot. Um, so here we are in July. We're a little behind. We don't have um, the actual code language, but I think it's totally fine um, because of House Bill um, 2006. We, uh, any provider that wanted to do a shelter um, between now and um, uh, July 1, I think, of uh, 2022 would be able to go ahead and do that under 2006. And um, it's essentially the super siting bill. So our work here is gonna provide an avenue through the development code to allow the different shelter types. Um, and because of 2006, we have, you know, there's not like a huge rush, but um, you know, these things take so much time. I think it's really good that we're keeping going on this right now. Um, but I think it's okay that we're a little bit behind. We're in July right now. Um, we don't have the code language and we haven't gone out for community um, review or uh, engagement quite yet, but I'll talk about that towards the end of the meeting. Um, so I think it's totally fine. Um, and hopefully we'll have some code language too, or, or soon that we can um, go out for that review. So I just wanted to review the progress from last meeting. Um, so at the last meeting, uh, the sounding board, you all uh, approved the definitions of three types of shelters. Um, we made some good progress on outdoor shelters and the number of spaces um, that seemed doable um, and, and realistic based on lot sizes. And, and we sent out that memo on June, I think 13th, and we'll go, go through that. Um, you asked for additional info on the numbers of units and spaces for the different shelter types and for information also on the paving standards. So uh, we'll talk about that. And then a couple days after our um, last meeting on June 9th, um, we had the community building subcommittee. So uh, that's the smaller subcommittee of council. It's, uh, it was Councilor Campbell, um, uh, Schenkelberg and uh, Keebler. And then uh, we had Hans and Kathy, um, Hans from the NLA, Kathy um, Austin from uh, AHAC, and then uh, Councillor Perkins there, as well as Scott Winters from Planning Commission. Um, you had questions at the last meeting about the type and the review process. And so we asked the, the subcommittee about that. Um, it's, it's a little bit up in the air and I think our recommendation is to have you go through the process of developing the standards and then we can work with um, planning and Colin Stevens I think is on the call today to talk about this, but to figure out a method to either go type one or type two. It is really dependent on how much flexibility we wanna provide um, in our 
in our code language, if we want to be flexible and, and apply some discretion, um, then we're looking at more of a type two process. If we want to do the rigid standards, um, then we can probably do a type one. The subcommittee felt that they would like to keep it type one if we could. And so given that direction, um, I, you know, we can craft code standards to come back and then work with planning to figure out the best method to do the, the review. Colin or anyone, um, go ahead and unmute if I've missed anything or Hans or Kathy, Megan, anyone. <clears throat> Susanna, I think that uh, one of the things that was mentioned was the concept of in the residential zone to be a type two and in the commercial zone to be a type one. That was another option that was discussed mm -hmm. so that there was opportunity for sort of neighborhood input. Um, the other thing was talking about if, we're, if we are just doing type one of having a good neighbor policy that would be available and um, Hans, I don't know if you remember anything else on that, but those are the two things that stand out to me. Yeah, I think we did talk about a good neighbor type of agreement. I wanna point out that we could, we could choose ultimately type two. And again, we understand that we don't wanna create false hope, if you will, but I, I think there are some merits to the type two. We, we talked about pros and cons, but I just want us to remember that we could choose type two and still, uh, try to approach this from the best practices uh, and we could still have a good neighbor agreement. And that might, the combination of type two and a good neighbor agreement might be a way to get even more community support. Just a thought in terms of community support. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, I think uh, the good neighbor agreements, um, the, the counselors were definitely in favor of that. Um, and so we've got a recommendation for you to vote on um, in a bit on that. Um, I can't Susanna, say can I, mm -hmm. can I jump in on that? I just wanted to remind everyone that, um, you know, while I think, you know, it's definitely something to keep in mind what type of review process you would like to recommend. I think the, um, the decision and the uh, determination of what type of review process is primarily a legal decision about what types of standards and what type of decisions will be made based on the standards that you recommend. Um, and so I think it's, important to keep in mind what what kind of participation will kind of notice that kind of thing, but also at the end of um, this process, we'll have a set of standards that you all have recommended. And then I think our planning and legal staff will take a look at that and make a recommendation to you based on what you've come up with, if that legally should be a type one or type two, or maybe if the recommendation is type one, but you wanted to elevate it to a type two, that could be part of the conversation. But I just wanted to, to say again that a lot of the distinction between a type one and a type two has to do um, legally with what the standards are. Yeah, Colin, do you have anything to add? I don't, that was very well put, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> okay, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, okay, great. Um, the community building subcommittee also had a lot of good impact on kind of humanizing the notice. I know we get very legalese in the planning world, um, kind of because we have to be with state law and everything and regulations, but um, through that good neighbor agreement process, there could be a way to, um, to do um, a fair amount of outreach um, between the city and the provider. So um, anyway, if you haven't seen the committee building subcommittee meeting, it was a good one. I can resend out the link and I think there was some really good input. So um, we also asked the, the subcommittee about the number of spaces, units for outdoor shelters. And um, because I think we've been kind of grappling with, with you know, how to, how to uh, determine that number and they recommended working with the service providers to, to determine that. So I think we've kind of been doing that through our process and we've come up with a formula that I think reflects that, um, that we'll talk about. Uh, so let's see. Um, so, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing all this. Okay, so going through the, the memo that we sent out on June 21st, um, we proposed in doing some um, kind of illust illustrative uh, math, <laughs> um, we looked at 
I think at the last, uh, our last meeting, we were sort of thinking between 400 and 500 square feet per unit or pad for outdoor shelters. And um, we went back and kind of did some figuring out, taking out setbacks, parking, all that kind of stuff. And going with 400 or 500 square feet a unit is great, but it becomes kind of complex. And it turns out that once you take out the setbacks, parking requirements, other requirements, it's very similar numbers wise to the ratio of a thousand um, square feet per space for those outdoor shelters. Um, and so we felt like this was a good formula to use in residential, commercial and mixed use zoning districts. So essentially, and I wish I would have pulled up the table that I sent you in the memo, but um, for you know an acre um, site, it would be 43 spaces. Um, if we have a, you know, a two acre site, it would be double that. It's an easy number to figure out. A provider could still put a community building, but the, they could still have the number of units based on that thousand, um, thousand uh, square foot per space uh, formula. So does that make sense to folks? Yeah, can you just, I just want to, so you're saying for one acre, you could have 43 spaces based on the 1,000 square foot number and a community building? I think you could. Yeah, I think that was our intent. Yeah. So if, a, correct me if I'm wrong, Pauline or Elizabeth, we kind of worked on this together, but I think, um, I think that was our intent that we're not saying that each space has to have a thousand square feet, but this is just the method to to figure out the maximum number, kind of like the carrying capacity of the site. So if it's a 10,000 square foot space, um, you could have 10 units and you could put a community building on, on that um, and still provide the 10 units. And I think that's a little bit what um, St. Vincent de Paul's micro unit village is doing and they have services adjacent. So using that thousand square foot kind of blueprint will allow Kind of some flexibility for the for the provider depending on um, you know the arrangement they would like to provide but it just gives us kind of a, a good round number yeah as Susanna said that wouldn't be sort of each unit needs to be surrounded by a thousand square feet of space it's just the number of setting how many can you place on this location and then the size and the spacing of the units and then how much space you need for parking and community building and walkways and all of that is a separate analysis. This is just the number to say, what's the maximum number that could go on a, a lot of any particular size? So I think that's very reasonable from my experience. I haven't done too many homeless shelters, but I do think that that makes a lot of sense. I guess um, the only exception would be if it was co-located with a community building and parking on a separate lot, there might be some consideration, but if everything is located on the specific lot, I think that that, um, that square footage makes sense to me. Anyone else have input? Hans, I see your hand raised, but you're muted. Uh, you're muted. Go ahead. Sorry about that. So the thousand square feet, I, I guess it's not clear to me. Are we proposing that this would be written into code? And I, I'm, cause I'm concerned if it is not to exceed one per thousand square feet, I'm concerned about that to Kathy's point, we could be missing some opportunities here. Um, notwithstanding the co-location thing, it's conceivable, even though this is a, we took into consideration a building space setback parking, it's a, it's a great number and it's a straightforward number, but are we saying that if we wrote this into a code that it would be a not to exceed number? Are we painting ourselves into a corner or missing opportunities? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I think anytime you know we propose a number, we might be um, shortcutting something. We, we looked at our existing um, sort of similar um, arrangements, you know, between Veterans Village, what other cities have done 
um, things like that. And it did seem to come out um, pretty equal. I mean, some might have smaller spaces, but then they've got the community building and things like that. So it seems like a reasonable number um, to us. We could certainly go down to something like um, one per 700 square feet um, or one per, um, you know, 500 square feet. But then uh, that it seems like a lot of um, spaces. And when you do the 500 square feet and you come up with more, you have like the, then the number doubles and then you have more parking um, required, then that sort of takes up the same amount of space as just saying, you know, basing it on one per thousand square feet. And again, we wouldn't require this, but this is kind of the carrying capacity of the site. So okay, Susanna, good. would it be possible to have an exception, you know, underneath that, if, if we codify this, have an exception, should, should a, uh, a shelter be co-located on with a separate lot that has all the parking and a community building or just the parking or whatever, that there's an ability to increase the density and come up with a specific number for that. Or, you know, I, I know we want to be as specific as possible, but uh, in my experience, there's usually a lot of exceptions on certain types of codes. And so I'm just putting it out there that, you know, especially, especially if parking is on an adjacent lot, that that's a large part that takes up space. So yeah, suggesting um, that. Uh, Colin, do you have any input on that or Pauline? Scott, even Scott Winters? Uh, <clears throat> <we're>, you <clears throat> when you generally review a site, <clears throat> a site can be several different lots. It doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, one distinct unit of land. And so we would we would consider that to all be in the same square footage or acreage for the site. So it's, we would review it just the same as we would. Um, and we, we would add that square footage of that adjacent lot into the actual site, if that makes sense. That makes total sense, thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it would be against the uh, service provider's interest to do something like that, to separate the lots. Um, it, it just, I, I just wanna say, um, I, I really like the work that you all have done to get this memo out. I think it was super informative. And, um, you know, I remember when we were talking about square footages last time, a lot of, we were, we were kind of uh, searching through the dark. And so I think this is, a, uh, I think it was really, really interesting to see how um, on the smaller sites, the setbacks just showing how much of a percentage it takes up. And, and I think I actually like the, the way that we're basing it off the square footage because for this, you know, much smaller, um, much smaller properties, we, you know, you're not going to have a large community center associated with it. So that, so then it allows more, uh, it allows more um, spots. And then for the larger properties, that community center um, is able to fit in there and then still find a lot of those spots because the setbacks take up less percentage of the property. So yeah, I think this is a, I think this it's a great work that everyone's done. And I, I like the, uh, I like the numbers they came up with, I think. I mean, to me, uh, to me, a thousand square feet seems fine, um, but I would probably more defer to people who have done these projects if there's any fine tweaking that they would want to do. I think the other consideration is I get concerned if we do too high of density for community members and perception. Mm -hmm. And then also for our houseless community who will be moving in, I think a lot of them have been out in very large spaces. And if we do too high of density, I think it, it mm -hmm. may um, limit those that want to come into a project like this. So this seems like a kind of a, a happy median um, where we will be able to have, a, you know, a, a nice number of folks in a certain square footage, but that we're not going to be packing in people so tight because I think the fear is that high density. Um, so thank you for all the work on that. Yeah, I think someone someone brought it up last time of, of they might not want to use these facilities if you make it too restrictive or it's you're too close to your neighbor and they'll just go out in the woods somewhere. 
Uh, so yeah, that was pretty interesting, eye-opening. Yeah, I want to reiterate uh, or, or say, I guess, because I didn't say it the first time, I really like the thousand feet. It's straightforward. It's based on good rationale that we use. And I appreciate Stacy's input, but I always have to check myself and remember to look at the other side of the equation as well. But I think the thousand square feet also is so easy for people to conceptualize. You know, if someone's saying, well, that lot could be X. Yeah, you know, it could be six sites. It could be eight sites. It could be four sites. I, I think it's easy for people to process. And I, I, I struggle a little bit with the parking ratio because I'm not sure. Sometimes I, I wonder how many vehicles we will need to provide for. But again, we could work this over and get into the weeds on this kind of stuff. And I think something simple like this, and there, there will be a not less than because there has to be ADA compliance or what have you, but I really like the straightforward thousand feet and 0.5. Um, but I, I was just trying to be sure that, that, you know, we gave ourselves an opportunity to see the other side. Okay. Were you saying you think there may be need to be more parking or that no, they actually, might end up? Yeah, actually, Scott, what I was thinking, I, and I don't know, I don't, it, it's hard for us to characterize or generalize the population on any given shelter, right? So it yeah. seems to me that there's times where, gosh, why do you have 20 parking spots here? I mean, four people have vehicles, right? And then someone's going to say, God, what a waste of space. You could have had more, you could have had more beds. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm always trying to look at the other side of it, but you know, I don't know that we can get into five different types of parking for five different types of shelters. And I don't know the population and, and I don't know how many people will have vehicles or not. Uh, so at a point you have to, I think you do have to pick a number and probably keep it straightforward. I think this amount of parking spaces might be more, it might exceed the amount of vehicles for each of our houseless guests, but I think we have to remember that we'll have service providers mm -hmm. and volunteers, if volunteers can't park, they will just not help. So I think that's another consideration as we get volunteer groups and social service providers coming in to provide uh, support that the parking spaces and I'm finding it is all over the board right now uh, in terms of how many people have vehicles. So we might wanna look at, I think maybe some of the social service agencies should look a little more and see if we can get some more numbers of vehicles. And I have to tell you, vehicles come and go. People are buying five and $600 vehicles. They can't afford license and registration. So then they're shortly towed away and it's more expensive to get it out of that than it is to get a new vehicle. And that's one of the commitments that we have is we're working with folks to get car insurance and registrations and their license. Um, so it is, a, it is a conundrum for sure. Stacy, you just, those, those points you just made, what you said earlier about acknowledging that we have services that aren't always utilized. These are all really good talking points, I think for our outreach, recognizing if someone questions the number of parking spaces, that just all those things you just mentioned, including volunteer work, um, I, I, let's make a note to keep these, these bullet points in our outreach because they really speak to a lot of the, the misinformation or lack of knowledge about some of these considerations. I, a couple of things you just mentioned, like volunteers, it was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, they don't have a place, thank you. Yeah, I just put some input here. I suggested a half, um, space per unit to Susanna back at the beginning here, because that's our experience at a veterans village based on the probability of the number of residents that will have cars and then the service providers that will be at the site full time. And, you know, there'll be two case managers on site and then, um, you know, neighbor impact or other, other service providers coming volunteers, like Stacy said. And so that, that was kind of the background of the number of that, that I proposed. Great. And, you know, we can always, I, and I know Pauline's ears are probably burning with me saying this, but we can always, you know, test this out and see if it's working. And if not, we can do a code amendment <laughs> later down the road, but it seems like this is a reasonable place to start. So, yeah. Okay. Well, great. Good input on all of that. Let me um, resume sharing because I think I have another question on this slide. Uh, I don't know why it 
it's going back to there. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Dana, did you have anything to add on that, being somebody that's developed uh, shelters and things? Uh, not particularly, because I was thinking about the time we talked about parking in the past and um, like my experience with shelters, uh, we only had the designated parking with um, the building that was formerly the um, sheriff's office because uh, you know, being in a city environment, there was no guaranteed parking. So this is something that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, the next, so we thought the, the thousand feet, um, thousand square feet per, per unit um, based on lot size was a good place to start for not only residential, but the commercial and the mixed use zoning districts. And this is again, for just the outdoor shelters. So the managed camps and um, tiny home village type things. Um, what we haven't really discussed yet um, we've been sort of dancing around it is in industrial districts. So there's a little bit of, a, of an issue with um, industrial uses being next to residential from a safety perspective. In talking with the building department, um, it's, it's not so much zoning districts so much, but it's like the existing use. So if it's a existing use that has flammable materials and things like that, we probably don't want to put um, a shelter next to that. And it would take substantial firewalls and improvements for that. Um, honestly, probably the service providers and the people looking at managed campsites are gonna be aware of that if there's something like a Sutera, um, even a distillery is gonna have flammable alcohol next door. Um, so they're probably gonna to wanna to do their own kind of due diligence and weed those sites out just for the safety of, of both. Um, the business and the people living next door. Um, but we have light industrial uses that might be able to accommodate the outdoor shelters. So it's something to put in the back of our minds if we wanna go ahead and look at our light industrial zoning districts for suitability of a managed camp or, or an outdoor shelter type of thing, but probably not the, the HI, the heavy industrial, because um, those are a little more intensive. And Colin, I don't know if, you want to unmute and add to that. Um, but we haven't really touched on the industrial zoning districts. It seems like using the same ratio is a good place to start and sort of let um, the service providers figure out if, if the site is suitable or not um, from there. Colin, do you have anything to add? Anything to add? No. <clears throat> okay. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to interject. I'm hopefully not blowing it up. No, um, what Tenant it. Bill 8 says is that industrial sites, as long as they're not heavy industrial, can be used um, if they're publicly owned. And so I wonder if that's what we might want to consider um, is having that public ownership as a component. If we do, I, I don't know if this group wants to consider industrial, that's a whole different track. But um, if we want to model off of SBA, that may be something to consider. I'll leave that out there and I don't have strong feelings. It's up to you all to decide whether that makes any sense or not. It might not. Can I, can I weigh in? Uh, I have a, a question for Colin, um, but I, I would support being in light industrial and not limit it to just publicly owned. But uh, Colin, do we have a requirement for a specific setback from an industrial uh, lot to a residential lot? I mean, it might be that that is one way of handling it, like, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet, whatever it might be. Um, I'm just curious if that already exists. I'm not suggesting that we make it, if it doesn't, but because I think the providers will do their own due diligence, but I'm just wondering if we already have a setback. I'm looking that up. Maybe while Colin's looking up, I see Eric raising his hand. Yeah, I just wanted to state um, for the record that Clackamas County's Veterans Village is on industrial zone property. Okay. And it's working mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. Neighbors are all satisfied with the operation. And I believe you, the city of Eugene has some um, uh, similar facilities within their industrial zones. Yeah, I think it's in their um, light industrial, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. West Eugene. 
Okay. Well, Colin is looking up. I think there are some varying setbacks in the industrial. There's industrial adjacent to residential has a larger setback um, than just industrial adjacent to industrial. So it's something we could look at if this group wants to pursue um, allowing outdoor shelters in industrial. We could look at what the setbacks are and make a recommendation um, when we come back to you with code. Well, I would definitely support looking at light industrial. I, I can understand why we wouldn't want to do it near heavy industrial. So, so, um, so the way the setbacks work in the industrials, and there's no setback if industrial abuts industrial. Uh, however, if it abut abutting residential zone in this situation, no building or structure shall be constructed less than 20 feet from the residential district. And then, it, and then buildings over 35 feet in height have additional setbacks depending upon how high, how tall they are. So be, beyond 20 feet. So it might make sense, Colin, to apply those residential setbacks to an outdoor shelter use. Um, say an outdoor shelter use has to comply, outdoor shelter in the IL has to comply with the setbacks as if it's adjacent to residential. We could write it something like that. So there would be a 20 foot setback, for example. And parking would be allowed in the setback typically. So, you know, it's totally possible to design a site plan that accommodates that without negatively impacting the overall density. Yeah, great. Why don't we um, take your input and our, kind of my plan here is, you know, if you are okay with the thousand, um, thousand square feet per unit type of concept for us to go back and, and craft the code, draft code and bring it back at the next meeting. Um, so yeah, so Kathy's rating thumbs up. Okay, so we'll look at industrial language based on that also um, and come back to you. So great. Okay, anyone else have anything on that before we move on? Good neighbor agreements is next. Um, so uh, in the memo we sent out on June 21st, we talked about the uh, neighborhood meeting concept um, prior to developing an outdoor shelter. Uh, the community building subcommittee was not in favor of using an operating license. That's what we use for, oh, um, short-term rentals, uh, marijuana licensing, um, and different, different event type things, operating licenses, and they're renewed annually. And as part of that, um, you need a good neighbor agreement. Uh, we, I'm glad the community building subcommittee didn't want to grow that route because it, it's an extra layer for a provider to have to go through. And then there's occupants there and if you know, their license is not re, you know, renewed, then what do we do with that? The folks that are living there. So um, yeah, I'm, but they still wanted us to look into a dialogue between the neighbors. So I think we're gonna ask you um, when we come to your questions on and voting, um, are you in favor of a good neighbor agreement for shelter types? Um, so that would require a neighborhood meeting, um, notification of um, you know, the, the number of folks, details of the site, things like that. Um, so any discussion on that? I have a question for you, Susanna. Mm -hmm. If we do go, if, if not we, but the legal eagles at the city decide to go with type one because we've been very specific, um, we could still do a type one approval and have this neighborhood meeting and the um, good neighbor agreement, right? It's not, they're not mutually exclusive, right? Yeah, I think so. I think we could, uh, even with a type one, we could require that, right, Elizabeth? I think so. If we have sort of a form or a check the box of you have a neighborhood agreement that meets these conditions or like includes these provisions, you have held a neighborhood meeting that meets these provisions, you know, as long as it's, we're not applying any discretion to, to get into how good was your neighborhood meeting, how good was your outreach, that kind of thing. Yeah, because that seems like it might be a good compromise between, you know, making sure that we have good communication with neighbors and at the same time have an assured and quick approval to do something like that, as opposed to going to type two, I, I see Hans has some comment, but just the thought, you know, that that might be a good way of, of accomplishing what we want to do. Yeah, I, obviously it's, it's probably not a shock that I'm a proponent of a neighborhood meeting, but at the same time, we need to be cognizant that uh, some of the things we've run into 
when we talk the public meetings of a land use process, you know, there's some requirements there. There has to be input, there has to be a record. I mean, there, there's, there's a process. So we need to, I think when we, if we're gonna recommend a neighborhood meeting, we need to understand what our expectations are. And I, I think using land use, the public meeting and the land use process is probably a great place to start. I don't know why we wouldn't want to recommend a neighborhood meeting. I think it's in the best interest of, of the provider as, as well as the community, but I'm just recognizing that we want to be able to describe what has to happen in that neighborhood meeting, what the outcome needs to be, if there's a record, how, what that record is. So let's just be aware that we, we probably don't wanna just say neighborhood meeting without outlining exactly what those requirements are. Yeah, that Clear makes an objective, sense. Right? Clear an objective? I um, provided a neighborhood agreement examples for HLC that were referenced um, in the memo that you sent out. And um, I want to reiterate what Kathy said about, um, you know, not only is it about uh, informing, but it's creating that bond and that community and that understanding of neighbors. And, um, you know, there's many facets that go into it besides um, numbers and expectations. It, there's like an element of empowerment and usually included in the good neighbor agreement is a way uh, for folks to um, have a number if there's something that they feel is happening um, or like a contact, you know, something that's adverse or, or, you know, it's a way for, for folks to feel empowered. Like in times past, we'd had uh, information for like, um, mental health crisis services instead of calling police or, or calling a contact from the shelter. And I might be getting into the weeds here, but you know, I just uh, want, want to talk about that. Uh, yeah, of course, I think it's a great recommendation and that there's a lot of really good um, elements for community building and empowerment and um, creating a deeper understanding of like that, that these are, that we're all neighbors and we're in this together and so. And, and to that yeah. point, neighborhood associations, keep in mind that uh, that community building aspect, many of the neighborhood associations have ways for people to help each other, whether it's shoveling snow for someone that doesn't physically have the ability to shovel snow, or it's a community pickup, or in this case, an opportunity to give time or give, or give services or product to your local shelter. I mean, connecting with the neighborhood associations, this could be a, a positive two-way street so let's not forget the NAs in the equation as well. That, that is often a part of the good neighbor agreement is to participate in the um, neighborhood association and kind of talk about outcomes, um, you know, keeping uh, a great relationship of sharing other things that are happening that are successes in regards to maybe jobs or IDs or healthcare or getting that housing or um, elements like that. And then definitely the back and forth, like for instance, the Kenton Women's Village, um, very involved in the Neighborhood Association, um, help with uh, uh, the, the gardens and stuff. And yeah, the, the folks, there definitely is a back and forth of uh, coming and bringing meals or providing some sort of a class or helping folks with their resumes. And so yeah, definitely a two-way street. Thank you, Hans. Okay, great. Good input. So it's, uh, we'll have a formal vote on this um, in a bit, but um, sounds like um, it, good neighbor agreements and the neighborhood meeting would be a good thing. So good. Okay. So moving on, um, let's see, I'm on the July 13th memo now. Um, sorry to get that out to you so late. It was a little more confusing than, <laughs> than we thought it would be. So uh, the July 13th memo, um, covered multi-room shelters and group shelters and paving standards. So um, for the multi-room shelters, so those are the, the project turnkeys. And I think through all of this for our existing developments, um, we're gonna have something in the code that they are not so much grandfathered in, but you know, if they don't meet the standards um, that we are proposing these new standards, um, it's okay. So we're going to craft something like that. So really this is for um, new construction um, and new development that we might be seeing with all the state funding coming down the pike and things like that in the future. 
Um, so for multi-room shelter, so that's the project turnkeys, or it could be you know, a house in a single family zoning districts. Uh, what we did was, and it might make more sense to go to this next um, slide while I'm talking through this. Um, we took each of the, the residential zoning districts and this is the density range um, of units per acre prescribed in, the, in our development code. Um, and then we looked at our multi or a micro unit um, housing code. And based on the micro unit code, um, there's a density calculation of each dwelling unit is equal to four micro units. And so the maximum density is times by four per each of these. And this is the number of rooms per acre, basically, you end up with. And so using an, an example of a, um, a, a multi-room shelter on a 10,000 square foot lot, you would get a maximum room calculation of four. You get seven um, under the RS zoning district, and then the density um, gets more intense. So down to, sorry, my caption box is right at 40 units, um, 40 rooms um, in the high density residential district on a 10,000 square foot lot. And then it talks about um, this 5,000 square foot lot example, just to give you an idea of what that might look like. Um, so this is a place to start. It's a little confusing, but it gave us an option of looking at um, how to look at the multi-room shelters. Just an example, the project turnkey is 28 rooms. Um, I can't remember what it's zoned, CL, I think it's commercial. And so our proposal is to use the highest, the high density residential calculation for the commercial districts as well. So um, that's where we started. Um, Elizabeth or Pauline, do you have anything to add on that or Colin? No, okay. It was a lot of back and forth and a little confusion on my part, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Hans. Suzanne, I, I, I know this could seem like a, a busy table for some, but I, I kind of get it, I guess, because the numbers work for me, but um, will it help at some point, especially in our outreach, if, if we have these sorts of examples that maybe there's one more column uh, that shows existing facilities and, and how they fit in here, whether it's Shepherds or Bethlehem or you know the hotel that we're purchasing. Um, I wonder if that would help people understand because they can conceptualize and say, okay, oh yeah, I know what that looks like. Oh, okay, that mm -hmm. makes sense. I'm just wondering if, if that has value and we could leave it as a rhetorical question. I don't need an answer. I'm just, just a thought to put out there. Oh, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And we kind of went through and made sure our existing ones sort of fit in this, in this model. Seems like they do. Um, I'm sure we're probably going to run across something that'll throw us off. Um, does anyone else have any questions or input on that? It looks complicated, but once you kind of understand where it's going, it's, it's a little easier to decipher. Is, well, I think for the visual learners, um, just maybe not a visual learner, but I think just being able to conceptualize, oh, it's like that facility or another facility, those that aren't number driven might just, their eyes might glaze over a little bit at this table, but if you could just put even a picture of, of shepherds or whatever, I, I think it helps people or, you know, or Eric's village. Um, I just think that helps people understand what we're trying to do here. But I think some of those are in a commercial zone as opposed to residential. If we could maybe pull out Don's house or the loft or some things that are for sure in a residential zone um, might be helpful. But I don't disagree that we need to have those good images. Uh, maybe, maybe there's another section here that does address the commercial zone where it makes it easier to explain that. Yeah. Is Don okay. South in RS? Oh boy. Um, let's it's either RS or RM. It's right around the corner for me. And it's, yeah, okay. but, it, but it's definitely residential. I think it might be RM actually. Um, so we're I'll, on I'll look and let you know. Okay, thanks. 
It's either there, RS there or other, yeah. there are other shelters in RS um, and other parts of, of town that just look like that we, so home from the outside. Do we have any examples of sh current shelters in RL? Um, I'm trying to think of um, the Saving Grace house. I'll, I'll look and see. Um, I can't remember how many rooms that is. Stacy or Dana, do you know Saving Grace? You know, I don't know for Saving Grace, but what about the Women's um, Shepherd's House? I think there's nine rooms in that house. Okay. I don't know where they fall under. I don't either. We can do some looking. Um, this seems, uh, let me just resume my share. I, I would just caution though, check with the providers. They may not want to draw attention to their facilities. Yeah. And especially for women's shelters, they're often from abusive situations and it's not appropriate to yeah. be in where they are. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So uh, we'll do some looking just behind the scenes and make sure this, this sort of works. But um, we, we felt like we needed to come up with some sort of formula um, for these type of shelters, because uh, if we just kind of default to our bed and breakfast or hotels type of thing, there's no maximum um, number of rooms and it felt better to sort of um, work with the micro units that um, these are more, more like a micro unit than a hotel room. So that's, it's just a starting spot. And then it maybe would help um, control the carrying capacity of the, of the parcel and the neighborhood. So um, we can talk about this when we come to vote on this formula, um, but we can always come back to this as well. So. Yeah, I guess my two cents is it seems fine, except for the low density seems a little bit low, just for four rooms on 10,000 square feet. I think that's overly constrained. Maybe six would be a good number or something like that. But then it would get off the, the code of the micro units. Yeah, Paul yeah. or oh, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say the, the micro units, one of the things about them is that it it requires a, a bathroom in each room. And I'm assuming these are not necessarily that way. Um, and I also just want, so, so it seems like these could probably be more dense than, than micro units. Um, and also I want to say that the accompanying imagery with this as it moves forward and city council discussion, I think is really helpful uh, because I think yeah, a lot of people are gonna see RS 30 rooms an acre, and they're not gonna go through the calculation of acreage. They're just gonna see 30 rooms and they're gonna imagine 30 rooms next to their house. And, um, you know, a lot of these are just, I, I remember back when I was doing construction, we, I remember remodeling a house uh, and it was, it fit in that it was a pre-existing house in the neighborhood. And there was just a little bit of renovation done to make it a, um, a shelter like this and it it was indistinguishable from every other house in the neighborhood and having imagery like that showing like this this is an example of one of these units you know you wouldn't be able to pick it out if you were if you were standing in the street looking down the block uh, i think something like that's pretty helpful I would agree with what Scott just said about the micro units because we worked on this and they do have to have their own bathroom and a little bit of a kitchenette area and that's quite different than perhaps what this would be and so I would agree that maybe it could be upped a bit in the low and the standard um, but how to do that I'll leave it up to you guys that I'm just agreeing <laughs> with Scott that well. there is a difference because and, and especially for accessible bathrooms, they're like an eight foot square. So, you know, just, uh, yeah, I agree with Scott. Yeah, I think we had up to what for accessible units, it was like 480 square feet or something like that. And that would essentially just be a room. Uh, if, if, if it didn't have a bathroom in it, it, it seems like a fairly large room. Yeah. All right. 
All of our veterans village units are accessible and we're 144 square feet and we have a bathroom and a sink in every unit. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'll just say that a few um, of the smaller sort of single family home type shelters that I'm aware of are in um, either RM or RS around the city um, that are kind of, I think what Scott is talking about, they were renovated single family homes. Um, and then this density calculation was our suggested place to start. And I think what we could end up with in the code is either just maximum number per acre or a maximum sort of calculation. So if you guys have recommendations for tweaking these numbers, we can write the code to match what you think um, the right maximum should be for each, um, each zoning district. We did, Elizabeth had uh, factored in, but we took it out. But um, the 25% uh, additional, it's a bonus for affordable housing. Um, and we could go back and that gave each, each uh, district a bit more, well, 25% more. So um, yeah, with the four, you could do six and then uh, you could do about 10 in RS. Um, so we could look at, um, you know, adding that back in, that might be a better place to start. I think that makes perfect sense. And honestly, a bathroom is about 25% of these micro units. So it kind of corresponds. And anyway, it seems like a reasonable approach and, and there's a rationale behind it because of the density bonus. Yeah, so I think it's a it's a 50% affordable housing bonus. Oh, I'm just sorry. looking back at the calculations that we went through. Um, if, yeah, 50% would make it six. And, would yeah, make it six yeah. in RL, yeah. Okay. For a 10,000 square foot lot. So six, basically a six room house plus whatever else you put in the house. Yeah, so we could look at uh, re-adding that in. Um, if folks were amenable to that. Let me go back here. Okay, I'm seeing some thumbs up and we can have an official vote in, um, in a little bit. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go back up. Great, this is good input. And of course, this is a place to start and we can come back with the revised codes, code and tweak it again if it doesn't look right. And of course, it's gonna go through public review and then planning commission and council and everything. So, okay, great. Um, so let me go back here. So for group shelters, um, we, you had commented on this, folks that had actually been in construction and um, just deferring to the building occupancies. And so um, that's where we ended up with the group shelters. So, um, you know, every building has a maximum occupancy based on fire and things like that. We can't really imagine a new shelter being constructed um, as a group shelter. Most of these are probably gonna be going into existing facilities. And if there is something constructed, I'm thinking of the navigation center that we got funding for, that's gonna have a super siting ability and it will defer to building codes. Um, and so we just thought we might as well just leave it up to that. I don't know if the group has um, input on that. Um, let me go to unshare and discuss. Okay. How do folks feel about just going with the building occupancy? Yes, yeah. <laughs> just make it easy. Okay. Because okay. Okay. you can't be less restrictive. I mean, and the alternative, uh, yeah, I don't see a point to it. Yeah, the only thing I was thinking about is if, um, you know, this would fall into more of an emergency shelter type of situation though, but if there was a gym or something and um, that occupancy is really, is 400 people or something, then 400 beds, is that too much? But I could only see the school district being okay with a, using a gym for a shelter in an emergency situation or something like that. Um, and we I was gonna say if it's an- way. If it's an emergency situation, maybe we can just, you know, if you have more than four or 500 people, it means there's something more important to focus on than counting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Getting 
some head nods. So we'll vote officially um, in a few slides. Okay. Go back to this. Okay, and finally, um, paving standards. So uh, we met with uh, private development engineering and basically they are in agreement that uh, we can have some variation in our development code for um, houseless shelters of any of the three types. I started with just the outdoor shelters and then they said, no, we could do it for any of them. So we just need to be specific in our development code um, and we would just defer to the ADA standards. So it's gonna vary on the site conditions and you know, whether the site has sidewalks adjacent to already, uh, whether the, there's a paved driveway apron, but basically um, it's a little bit like our 4212 applications. Um, so Veterans Village and the St. Vincent de Paul uh, development. So um, there's a minimum number provided by the building code of the, of the number of ADA spaces you have to have. And so those could be paved. The rest of the surface could be gravel. And depending on the site conditions, you may, may have to pave part of the driveway apron. And that's mainly to keep um, plowing okay in the winter and then gravel from coming out on the right of way. Um, but basically we can, we can work within the parameters of the ADA and not require the entire site to be paved. Um, so does anyone have any questions on that? Thank you so much. This is so important yep. and I'm, yeah, we need to do this. <laughs> Boom. All right, good. Anyone else? No, okay. So we'll come back with some uh, language regarding that, um, regarding paving. So let me go ahead to make sure. Okay, so I think we're up for some actual voting. Um, Councillor Perkins, I don't know if you wanna lead the, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, so where are you? <laughs> okay, we're having one of those technical days. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Um, does anyone want to, um, I'm not sure how to do this, move to recommend that uh, the sounding board uh, recommend flexible paving provisions? Elizabeth, do you want to Chime in. I'm not sure. I was just going to say, okay. Suzanne, I'm not sure we need to go as formal as, as having formal motions, but if we could get um, sort of direction to staff to go back and um, sort of these are the questions that we posed to you today. And if we can get, you know, a more formal thumbs up or head nod and agreement from the board, sounding board to, to go write these provisions into code and, and bring them back as part of the package for you that you're gonna see to recommend to city council. Um, I think we also heard one of the adjustments we heard today was add the 50% um, affordable housing bonus in calculating the maximum density for multi-room shelters to the, the micro unit kind of baseline and set that as the max um, for multi-room shelters. Um, I'm not sure I heard any other changes on these four questions. So um, I think maybe Susanna, if you could go through the list of um, sounding board members and just get a verbal yes or no or additional comments from each person, um, we, can, we can take that as our direction. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank can you. everyone see? My, my mute button was not working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's one of those days. Okay. Um, okay. That sounds like a good way to go. So uh, let me just go through the folks that are here. Okay. Eric Tobiasen, um, are you okay with these questions? And can everyone see the questions I've been pausing and sharing? I can't tell where I am. Um, so flexible uh, paving provisions and um, deferring to the ADA requirements. Mm -hmm. And then, so Eric, can you see the question? Yeah, I approve of all these these four bullets. Okay, and did you wanna add the 50% additional density? I do. Okay, uh, Kathy? Yeah, I, uh, I approve everything with the uh, 
increase in the density bonus for the calculation. Okay, Dana. I also agree of all the bullets and the 50% density. Okay, Han, great. Hans? Agree, including 50%. Okay, Brianna? Agree, including the 50%. Okay, Stacy. I agree, including the 50%. Okay, great. And Councillor Perkins, I think you get to vote. <laughs> oh, I agree. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, and, perfect. Uh, Elizabeth Johnson, I just want to give you the opportunity to speak at this point and, and let us know if you had any thoughts or feedback on, on the discussion so far or these four bullets. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I you know, I recognize I don't have voting um, abilities and that's that's completely appropriate. You guys have been doing a lot of work already um, and I want to respect that you guys have put so much effort into all of this and just um, make sure that you're aware that I, I do feel like the work you guys are doing is wonderful. Um, I would, if I did have voting ability, I would uh, agree to all of these bullets as well. Um, just uh, before we wrap up, if there was any way that the Human Rights and Equity Commission could help, I think one of the previous meetings that we have had um, with some of the service providers um, and a few of the HREC members was you know, coming to the agreement that we would like to support the city more in their efforts in trying to um, be a positive um, influence on what's happening and be able to communicate more to the community about the amount of work and the, the positive impact that you can have. So if anybody has some ideas, please feel free to reach out to me and let me know um, how we can support you better in all of their, your endeavors, because I think you guys are doing a really, a really nice job of being very inclusive of many um, challenging situations. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth, for Elizabeth Ochel for <laughs> prompting that and Elizabeth Johnson for your comments. Okay, um, let's see. Well, great. Okay, so moving on, let me go down. Okay, so community engagement. I'm gonna, um, it's gonna take me a second if you wanna take a little break or something while I get this um, queued up, but I have to switch and show you what we're thinking of. And now that you've made decisions or, or made, made recommendations, we can go ahead and start populating our ideas for the community engagement. So this is great. So if you wanna just give me a minute, I'm gonna stop sharing and then get a different um, screen up. I just wanna thank Elizabeth Johnson for that and also being a part of this. I think it makes so much sense to, um, to collaborate and have that communication going forward. So I just wanna thank everybody for making that happen. Hey, and I was, I got kicked out again. I know, I don't know why you keep getting <laughs> and, kicked out. Well, no, that one, that one, the, uh, the, I, the iPad I was using, even though it was plugged in, was slowly draining battery and, and eventually ran out. Um, oh, so I didn't get your vote. Yeah, or your, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I vote, I approve everything uh, with the 50% addition. So. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So you're fun. saying it's not your personality, Scott, that keeps getting you kicked out of this group? I don't know. Somebody, I think somebody <laughs> just keeps kicking me out. I think that's what it is. Okay, let me make sure there's no one else in there. I don't think there is. And that got kicked out. I don't think so. Okay, I'm, I think I've got the, okay, here we go. Um, Okay, let's see. So um, most of you have probably seen um, some of the city's other storyboards uh, for like the neighborhood street safety projects and things like that. And of course, this is just a work in progress. And now that um, you've given us some guidance, we can go back and um, work on this a little bit more. So this is great. Um, so I don't think we've done, we've used a, a story map before to get um, kind of community input on different topics. So this is kind of cool, but um, basically we can populate 
any of these tabs with whatever we would like. And so this is where your input on um, the types of images and information on each of these different shelter types um, can really come to life, I think. And so probably over the next couple of weeks, I'll be maybe contacting some of you for information on different, um, different uh, shelter types and, and images. Kathy, I know you were working with a group on something and I know a lot of the surface providers have a lot of different images out there. I kind of want to be sensitive and not show too much identifying information on sites, but um, anyway, I might be contacting you for some ideas. So this is where we can put information about the different um, types of um, different sizes and different zoning districts and maybe tell a little bit of, of a story about each type. Like you're not gonna see 40 of these next door to you if, you, if there's a 5,000 square foot lot, um, things like that and talk about good neighbor agreements and maybe do a little factual information, especially on this main main site, we can talk about um, kind of the, the story of the houselessness and um, incorporate our new point in time count um, figures. We can link to different, different um, websites and things like that. And then if you go down, so we can um, also embed a survey. So we can't so much ask folks, do you want this? Do you not want this? Um, we're not gonna go there. We're gonna ask more. Um, we are proposing uh, 10 beds maximum per acre. You know, I'm making up these numbers because I'm not remembering them off the top of my head, but 10, 10 beds in a, the low density residential district for a group shelter, something like that. And we can have kind of like the scale. Do you strongly agree, um, not agree, what, you know, whatnot? We're not gonna ask questions that lead to, we don't want these. Um, that would violate fair housing. And Elizabeth can talk a little bit more about that or Lynn, if she's still on the call. Um, but we wanna get good information and kind of more um, educate people about what we're doing and what they might be seeing, but not so much give them an avenue to say no thumbs down because we're not gonna, we're doing this. So, so this is what's happening. So. Um, and then, you know, we can do a similar thing for the multi-room shelter, talk about the project turnkey projects, um, talk about what they might see as far as a single family, more of a house type use instead of a hotel, things like that. And then do the same thing with the outdoor shelter and ask questions about that and talk about what we're proposing. Um, and so these, whatever we pose for questions will come back to me in, a, in like a Excel, format. Um, we can actually ask also some demographic information about people if they're willing to share um, where they live in the city and um, how long they've lived here, things like that. So uh, we can get a good snapshot. And again, this is not statistically valid, but it will hopefully help to get our ideas out there and get some input before um, this goes to planning commission and city council. So Hans, I see your hand raised, go ahead. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Um, I know that on our land use education work that the NLA is doing, um, we did a base survey and then we planned a follow-up survey to see if to what extent we had improved understanding or improved acceptance or people had um, used the resources. Something we might think about also, it occurred to me that um, some folks may not know what they, what zone they live in. They may not know if it's RL, RS, or RM. It's, that's a big question mark for a lot of people. We could ask that question. If we don't care, we could at least uh, give them a link and they could go to you know, the land use page and find out what their zoning is. And then they could say, oh, I, I see that, that that piece of dirt across the street is RS or RL, and this is what's possible. It might, might help some folks understand, you know, a, a lot of people don't even know about a comprehensive plan. I get that but we could direct them so that they could at least find out what can happen in their neighborhood, if that's a concern. Yeah, that's a great idea. We can definitely embed links to other places and um, there's a lot of existing information out there already. So yeah, we can definitely do that. Kathy? Yeah, I just, I don't know where this would fit, um, but it's a, it's a concern for me um, that some of our 
like old farm district, for instance, has CCNRs that'll prevent any of this from happening. And so there is a sense I've talked to some people feeling it's unfair. These people are sort of quote grandfathered in, they're not gonna deal with it. And other parts of the city are gonna be overly burdened with this kind of thing. And, and I don't really know where to go with that. And I don't know how we can explain to people that you know, we seem to be powerless at this point to deal with the CCNR issue. I'm hoping that at some point there is a way around it, but it doesn't, everybody that I ask, every lawyer that I ask says no. Um, but I don't know if that's a piece of information that should be in there or not. Um, but I just bring it up because there are large swaths of our city that even though they're residential will have CCNRs that'll prevent any of this from happening. Yeah, that's a good point. Elizabeth. I can respond to that, Kathy. I think, um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's true that there are CCNRs that may prohibit some or all of these uses. Um, I think we discussed earlier, there was a case um, of someone challenging CCNRs that prohibited them from having sort of a medically disabled family member live in an RV in their driveway. Um, and they challenged their CCNRs as, as against the ADA and they won. They were, the, the CCNRs would have, if they had still lived there, the CCNRs would have been required to do a reasonable accommodation under the ADA to allow the disabled family member, you know, to live in an RV in, in violation of the CCNRs, essentially. So, um, you know, that type of challenge has been pursued in the past by people who want a reasonable accommodation from restrictive CCNRs um, in different places. And, and there's at least one example where, where that was, um, you know, a, a required reasonable accommodation. Yeah, because the ADA being a federal law would um, supersede that um, arrangement. Yeah, but it would have, it would really have to involve somebody who is disabled in order to... For the ADA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I appreciate you bringing that one up. It, you know, and it's good that that was successful, but I don't know. Yeah. The other point I would make, Kathy, is we have seen, um, I think there's been two instances in the last couple of years where the Oregon legislature has passed bills um, purporting to override CCNRs, for example, in the event of a drought emergency and CCNR requirements for watering lawns. Um, I think there's definitely lawyers have different opinions on whether the legislature can or should be doing that. Um, recently, I think in the most recent legislature, there was a bill about family childcare, in-home childcare, um, and the legislature purporting to override CCNRs that would prohibit family childcare in a home. So I think the Oregon legislature has looked at it in a in number of different places, um, or at least in those two examples, um, whether those are valid, or whether they'll be challenged, whether there may be legislative interest in doing more of that, I don't know. But those are some examples of interaction between CCNRs and the legislature and, and other yeah. overriding laws. Yeah, it seems if we have as a city an opportunity to speak to our legislators and, and advocate for at the very minimum having accessory dwelling units on these lots seems like a reasonable ask. But yeah, count me in if you have any conversations about it. Let me just put it that way. Kathy, I, I, I appreciate but I do think we need to be prepared if council and staff are not wanting to get into the breaking of these contracts, if you will, between residents and such, it has a little bit to do with expectations. So if we're going to speak to, and it's appropriate to speak to CCNRs and their effect or their restrictive nature, but we do need to probably anticipate or at least know what our, what our appetite is for going after CCNRs. I mean, Otherwise, we could set some some bad expectations, I think. That's, that's yeah. a really great point, Hans. The, the city has always taken the position that CCNRs are a private agreement. We don't look at them. We don't enforce them. That is between the, the property owners in a given area. Um, so, for example, in the short-term rental application, it's on the applicant to know what their CCNRs say. We don't check to see, are you ap applying for something in violation of your CCNRs? Because it's between the property owners in a particular area. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I can have, see I the city not position. wanting to take a position on that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's just that, that there is a perception for people who live in like the central core area that they're going to be overly burdened mm -hmm. and that the wealthy areas like, 
you know, that have these CCNRs are not going to have to deal with it at all. And that seems very inequitable and unfair. And it just seems like in my perfect world, the CCNRs would just go poof and we could start implementing these kinds of things everywhere. But I recognize that's not the case, but I just think we need to, to address it somewhere in this communication um, mm. because it, it is a reality and yeah. Patty, I was going to say one thing too is uh, uh, outside of litigation, you might just be able to ask them to change the CCNRs. I, mean, I know that's kind of a long shot for something like this kind of development, but um, yeah, I live in Southeast and uh, we have, I have CCNRs and, and I did see some things change. We had a, you know, they, they might've been written depending on when the neighborhood was built and uh, you know, eighties, nineties, early two thousands. And, and I think maybe there was a, there was kind of a movement to be a little bit more restrictive in things and neighborhoods should just be neighborhoods and they should look like this with green lawns and everything. Um, and um, yeah, there is, they can be changed. And I think, uh, I think education to the members and maybe a little bit of shaming might go <laughs> a long way. It depends on the neighborhood, but yeah, no, I agree with you. The problem is, is you're gonna you're gonna get someone with a lot of money who's gonna say that you lower the value of their property, and they're gonna have unlimited funds to go to court, and you have to match that somehow. And 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 that's that's the issue. It seems it's much more at like a state level than a than a neighborhood or city level. But I think there are some, I think there's some neighborhoods right now that probably wouldn't allow it, but that might, that might once the, uh, I guess if, if asked or if uh, convinced, I'm an optimist. Okay. <clears throat> good, good input. It might be another um, sounding board topic <laughs> once we're done with this, this project. Yeah. Um, Okay, anything else? I think I'll, I'll work up, keep working on this and build it out a little bit more and then send it out for your review and everything before it goes out. But hopefully we can get some good um, education and comments on this. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. So I don't think we have anyone in the lobby for public comment. Um, Susanna, this is Elizabeth yeah. Johnson. I have a question. Hi. Mm -hmm. about your yeah. story map. When you are going to be doing your surveys, um, I, I like that idea. Are you also going to be allowing for any space for people to make comment? Well, we, we went back and forth on that. And um, I might tap Elizabeth O'Shell to talk about it a little bit more from a legal sense. Um, yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, I think one of the, so the fair housing question that, that Susanna um, raised or the fair housing concern is, you know, we don't, we are as the entity, you know, the city is the zoning authority and uh, are restricted by the Fair Housing Act to not, um, not legislate from a place of discriminate, discriminatory intent. And so we want to make sure that we are not um, opening up our survey to solicit uh, feedback that may discriminate against a protected class. Um, and so that's the idea behind sort of asking particular questions about sort of based on these recommendations. Are you more in favor, less in favor? Would you like to see this particular standard more or less up or down? Um, the place for sort of open comment would be at the planning commission hearing, the city council hearing or work sessions on these. That's a place for open-ended public comment. Um, in this particular outreach, I think the intention is more about providing information about where these recommendations came from, what the background is, and then getting specific feedback on specific standards and recommendations. Um, the time for open-ended public comment would be at those um, in-person or virtual meetings. I, I think all of that makes sense. I was just going to say if there was like could comment just that it doesn't get posted so other people can read it. So then it becomes like this never ending cycle of, oh yeah, what they said. And then it grows bigger. So it, I think if you did allow any type of free written comment uh, or open-ended that it just be 
submitted and it goes away into your guys' database, not for other public to view. But I like the approach that you're going, so. No, thank you. That, that does make a lot of sense. I just um, was curious as to what kind of avenues were available for people to make comment. And I agree with what Brianna said that, um, you know, making sure that it's really giving opportunity to multiple people and different demographics to be able to make the comments and to give their input, um, whereas not they're not just writing and piggybacking off of other ideas that they um, feel that somebody else has already made. So, no, that makes sense. Thank you. So I think um, it raises a good point, Elizabeth, that the, the website or the feedback, I forget what you're calling this, Susanna, um, could say, you know, how to contact the Planning Commission, how to contact City Council, when the public hearings will be, or how to find out when those will be scheduled to make um, sort of more open forum comment. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone else have any input on that or anything else? I'm just going to go to one more slide. Not. I'll, I'll get you um, kind of back and forth on that story map as it's developing. But I guess we're in, we're in July. We could run it the whole month of August. I mean, there's really no, um, you know, rush because of um, House Bill 2006. And so um, I think what Joshua Romero is on this call too. He's our communications person helping me with this. And I think... Um, We'll, we'll kind of powwow. It's always good, I think, to kind of, if you're going to launch something in the summer to make sure we're doing it a little bit in the fall too, because people are so, um, you know, scattered during the summer. So uh, we'll kind of figure out the best time frame. but it sort of affects when we next meet. So let me um, go ahead to our follow-up slide. Can I, can I ask, yeah, where, go where's it going to be nested on the website? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we'll probably put it under um, community priorities and maybe we can do the home. Um, we have the rotating home screen right now. It's fireworks, but um, oh, Joshua raised his hand. He can kind of fill me in. Yeah, Go ahead, so Joshua. I was just gonna say what Susanna shared is we can share it on the homepage of the city's website. And then I think community priorities is the appropriate place to do it as well. Um, and then in addition to that, there's sort of all the communication stuff that we do to um, send out sort of public engagement opportunities like this. So um, press releases, social media, nextdoor.com, et cetera. And is that going to conflict at all with the sort of current, because we have sort of a current houselessness page, right, already on the website? Or? We do, and so we could actually add it to that page. So then it's still kind of directing, keeping all of our houselessness work in one spot. So we can link to the input opportunity from that web page. Anyone else, Hans? You have your hand raised. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Sir. I I imagine we'll use uh, the usual approach: has been current Facebook page, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, Joshua, if we could be sure that Michaela puts out in, in her weekly when it's appropriate uh, to all the neighborhood association leaders, if you will, then we can uh, and put it down through the NAAs to get a little more input on the survey, kind of promote the survey. Yeah, absolutely, Hans. And I think she's done a great job in the past too of providing sort of copy and paste um, content for the neighborhood associations to post on their social media as well. So I will work with her on that. Would it make any sense to be able to link to it if somebody first goes to the uh, affordable housing page to also see a link to it, I think would be good. Yeah, Kathy, I can talk with um, Lynn McConnell and her team to see if that would be okay for us to add a link to that page as well. We can do it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, your <laughs> <laughs> well done, Joshua. <laughs> Check that one out. You just saved a meeting, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So uh, I have one more screen and um, let's see. I can find it. Okay. Just one more, one more thing to get through. So um, as far as uh, next steps, um, I'll be out the week of August 9th, which would be our usual time to meet. So I'll send out a, um, just a doodle poll or something like that on um, dates in August um, to meet. Or 
we could meet in September. We could save the August month and come back in September. So I don't know if folks have a preference. Um, we also need to go through RVs as an ancillary use. Um, so we talked about, you know, providing um, an allowance for a single family dwelling to house somebody in their driveway or other place on their property. Um, we have that allowed right now as part of our wildfire um, emergency order from last summer. I don't know, I don't think we've had many people actually take advantage of it, but it could be just another um, tool in our toolbox. And then we still need to discuss the temporary shelters for an emergency or another time limited duration. Um, so, and the main thing for that is just allowing them in our development codes. So um, if we are in an emergency, we don't have to go through the emergency order process. Um, somebody could just put, put an emergency um, shelter up. So we still need to kind of talk about those. Um, we could, what we could do if we wanted to not meet until September is do the public involvement stuff back and forth. Um, I could communicate with you all via email, um, and then we could work on some language for the RVs um, as the ancillary use and even the temporary shelters, and then come back to you in, in September with like the information we got from the community engagement and um, a draft code, basically. So um, do folks have any, any input on that? Um, I would like to just talk a little bit about the RV. Um, issue because I think I've heard a lot um, on um, social media about the need for that. And um, I think that that is something that the public might want to give input on during that August timeframe. And so I wish we could talk about it sooner rather than later. Um, so can I get some clarification from you is right now if somebody is um, has their house burned down, they can do this, but otherwise, like if you're just a houseless person, you, you cannot, or can anyone take advantage of this now? I, no. I see Elizabeth Osho. Yeah. Is... <laughs> so um, what we have right now is, I believe this emergency order is still in effect. We have an emergency order for um, allowing the use of an RV in a residential driveway, essentially, only by folks whose houses were lost in the Labor Day wildfires last year. Right. So, um, so it's very a, specific. It's in other very words. specific. So if your house burns down, our development code prohibits the use of an RV as a temporary dwelling unit or as a dwelling unit. Mm. Um, and we do have um, in the development code medical hardship housing, which allows for a manufactured home, but not, a res a, not an RV or a trailer to be used um, on a residential lot as um, temporary hardship housing. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the questions I think that we'll put before you is, what are, <laughs> is it uh, something you'd like to see, allow on a limited duration? Uh, would, would that be your recommendation to allow, for example, one RV per residential site as a dwelling unit on a temporary basis? How long? What other standards in place? Um, we could look at the medical hardship housing. Is that something to expand um, and recommend changing to allow for RVs or not? Um, and under what, what conditions? Yeah, so there's just a lot of um, controversy pro and con on this, but I think given sort of the situation on Hunnell Road, for instance, if it was possible for someone to take their RV from there and, and find somebody who's willing to host them, I think that that is a solution for folks that have RVs and campers that would really help the situation right now. Um, but, you know, I, I'm of, I am supportive of doing that with a limited duration. There are people who feel like that can't be a solution to housing because it's so substandard, but at the same time, it's better than nothing. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big conversation and I know we need to have it. I just think there will be public 
comment about that issue. And it, it's a shame that we can't get that into the um, that August conversation. Maybe there could be some preemptive um, input on that if you can't if we don't actually have any proposals so that people have an opportunity to weigh in one way or another on that. But I do, I do feel it's important. Um, and I, 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 would I think, um, yeah, Kathy, I appreciate your comments. And I, th I think we could include it in that. I don't see why we couldn't. I mean, um, you could, we could have a thumbs up from the rest of the members if we wanna include that on the August, you know, on the public engagement. Um, I, I like that idea. I was just going to share some of the other um, city have been things I'm involved in. And one of them, ha it's correlated because one of them is an issue with how long it takes to get a building permit in Bend. And so thinking about a short term solution that could provide even just workforce housing, which is not, not I mean, it could be homelessness, it could be related, but I think it could be a broader, um, I like the idea of it being short term, but we have such a housing shortage here that is beyond just homelessness. And so I think we could expand on that idea and sort of um, part of that other group that I'm in is going to you know, provide some recommendations to try and help get develop more development in Bend because it's taking so long, you know, you can't wait two years before you have a house to put somebody in if it's multifamily housing or affordable housing or any of these things. So can that be an expanded solution? And it seems kind of counterintuitive to not, I mean, yes, it's a short-term fix, but we need a short-term fix. We don't have really any other solutions. And um, yeah, so I think that could do a couple different things. Yeah, I don't see why we couldn't include it. Seems like it'd be great to get some feedback on the concept before we head down the road um, any further anyway. And I like what Brianna is saying because she's expanding it beyond the homelessness issue, but the workforce housing issue. And, you know, frankly, there are people who are doing this illegally in the city anyway, and it just seems you know, counterproductive. And, and I really urge us to, to address this. And for whatever temporary time frame it is, you know, I, I think it, it just needs to move forward and move forward quickly. Um, so thank you, Brianna, for bringing that up because I hadn't thought about that aspect, but yeah, for sure. A win-win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so do folks, do, do y'all want to meet in August? Then, or should we wait till second week in September? What do you What do you think? I'll say the I'm only way to meet in August. Yeah, what? 18th is much better than the twenty sixth. I think it was, but that's just me. <laughs> to meet in August? Sorry, I missed a little bit. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, August, and and I would also vote for the eighteenth. Uh, Sounds good. Okay, so the eighteenth and. Um, whomever can make it is great, um, but we'll probably have another meeting in September too. So, okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. We made a ton of progress today. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we'll go back to the um, code language and draft it all up, um, tweak it based on your comments, and we'll get the public engagement stuff um, ready to go and we'll loop back August 18th. I'll send out a Zoom invite for that. So thanks very much and for all your time and all the work you, you all do um, for the community and everything. So thank you. Anyone else want to say anything? Thank you, Suzanne yeah. and, and Councillor Perkins. I mean, this is just amazing that the city is doing this and I'm just really stoked and happy that I'm being part of it. So just thank you so, so much. Awesome. All right. You know, and I think that the council needs to be applauded for implementing 
sounding boards and committees of people who have expertise so that we can bring cogent suggestions back to them. And I know that there are people in the community who feel like, well, this, this isn't very democratic. You're, you're, you, you know, it's just a small group of invested people who are making these decisions and blah, blah, blah. And why can't it be everybody voting on everything? Which just totally drives me crazy because it's so anti expertise, you know, and so anyway, I want to thank you for recognizing that you, you all can't know everything. <laughs> and so you use these boards and commissions and sounding boards to help you make good decisions. And I just want to commend the city for doing that because it isn't every city that does that. And we're very fortunate that you are doing it. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Okay, stay uh, cool and non-smoky <laughs> out there. Bye.